Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the showcase. We're delighted you're taking some time on this Friday night to be with us and celebrate our writers and hear some fabulous, fabulous readings this evening. Um, I'm Bryn Saito. I'm a professor here in the Creative Writing Program at Fresno State, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2022 um, Creative Writing Prize Showcase, celebrating the award winners of the annual Creative Writing Prizes, which are supported by the Academy of American Poets, the Department of English, and generous community donors. Tonight, we're broadcasting from the Central Valley of California, the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples, and we are presenting readings by six of the nine award winners. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our Dean, Nora Chapman, and Associate Dean, Sergio Laporta, from the College of Arts and Humanities for their ongoing support. Also, huge thanks to our English Department Chair, Dr. Melanie Hernandez, and our amazing staff in the English Department, Lisa Galvez, Jefferson Beavers, and our student assistants, Mylise Carney and Christina Sandoval. A couple of Zoom reminders. Um, first, we ask you to keep yourself muted, your microphone muted this evening. We'll have lots of speakers who will be muting and unmuting themselves, and we'll be spotlighting the main speakers. Um, so we recommend speaker view um, on Zoom for the best experience. We have live captioning enabled if you'd like to see subtitles at the bottom of your screen, you just click live transcript and then show subtitles. And we invite you to use the reaction emojis on Zoom at the bottom of your screen to show your love for our readers um, and lots of applause and shout outs in the chat as well if you'd like. So tonight we are presenting readings by six of our award winners. Poets and writers will be reading from their prize-winning work, which was reviewed and selected by our judging panel of nationally recognized authors. So huge shout out and thanks to E.C. Belly, Mei Yang, Marisol Baca, David Borovka, and Chuck Radke for their time and energy spent reading submissions and supporting our students with your generous comments. Thank you so much. So with that, we will begin. And our first reader tonight is Rosie Bates. Um, Rosie is the graduate winner of the Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. She's a third year MFA candidate in creative nonfiction here at Fresno State, where she serves as the managing editor of the university's locally grown, nationally known literary magazine, The Normal School. She has been published in the Alpinist magazine, and she also has a cat named Steve. So please join me in welcoming Rosie Bates. Thank you, Bryn. Um, and thank you, Jefferson and the Department of English and especially Chuck. Um, yeah, thank you. It is the best cat name ever. She's actually a girl, so even better. Cat Stevens, we love her. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to read an essay and alongside the other award winners tonight. Um, this will be an excerpt from my essay um, titled Fear. When I was six, I spent most of the summer inside because I was afraid of trees, a tree falling on me. I sat at the massive lake facing windows in my grandparents' house in New Hampshire, watching my cousins playing outside while I stayed inside, apart, afraid. I'm frustrated that they didn't see the danger. Don't you know trees could kill you, I thought. I spent hours staring at the massive beast, slowly running my gaze up their grizzled trunks to branches that whipped, wood splintering, cracking. Sometimes during that summer, inceptions go out on the boat. I waited by the door, scouting out the path of least resistance, imagining my route through potential fall zones. Once there was a gap in the wind, I counted down three, one and bolted out the screen door. My path zigzagged through birch trees, lawn furniture, and inflate, inflatable inner tubes. I navigated my way down the hill through the sand onto the dock, my footsteps pounding on the uneven boards until finally I jumped into the boat yelling, start the motor now. I repeated this process when the boat returned to the dock, sprinting back to the safety of the house and back to my chair at the window. Dad remembers looking up to see my face, peering out the window with my neck 
craned, gazing at the trees as he and the rest of the family hung out on the lawn. Despite their repeated provisions and logical appeals, I was not deterred. Day in and day out, I rarely left my post. Inside, I felt safe. The warm October sun beat down on me as I hung in my harness, tethered to bolts drilled into the granite dome by the first ascensionists of this route we were climbing. I fed a rope out slowly from my belay device as Benton climbed away from my stance. The weather during the transitional time between summer and fall in Yosemite Valley is erratic. The day is uncomfortably warm and the mornings uncomfortably cold. On this day, I was on the verge of being uncomfortably hot and to distract myself from this fact was determined to keep a close eye on Benton's small deliberate movements as he led the pitch. Benton and I had finished the first 2,000 feet of climbing in just under three hours, simulti simultaneously climbing the whole of the route named Royal Arches. After finishing that route, we bushwhacked our way through a series of enigmatic climbing climbers trails shrouded in dense manzanita plants to the base of North Dome. There, we started up a route named Crest Jewel Direct, which merged midway up the dome with the original route, Crest Jewel. Situated near the center of North Dome, now having completed the first 500 feet, which comprised, which comprised the direct route, our next pitch of climbing sent us diagonally up and right following a two foot wide dike feature. The dike bubbling up from the rock near where my feet hung, shot out right like a line of longitude wrapping around the globe the top arc of its width, providing us with small imperfections, edges to stand on and climb across the otherwise blank face. I watched closely as Benton navigated the opening off balance moves on the dike, pressing his left cheek close to the wall. He searched for dime-sized crystals that glittered in the mid-afternoon sun. The dome was littered with these small protrusions that were almost invisible until you brought your face close to the rock. Once he found a crystal he liked, he wrapped one finger and thumb around their tiny bodies for stability, danced his feet right along the and repeated, like someone walking along the edge of a curb on their tiptoes with their heels hanging off and hands in the air for balance. Eventually, I noticed the angle of the wall would ease off so much that Benton could essentially balance on the dike's edges with his feet alone, pressing his left hand against the wall for stability. As he climbed, I imagined that the dike we were climbing was a magnified version of the white line pebbles mom collected when her family went to the Washington coast growing up. I remember the feeling of her dropping them in my small eager hands and how I rubbed my fingers against their smooth surfaces, tracing bumpy imperfection, like someone had taken a white pencil and traced a circle around their centers. She told my sister and me that the stones whose white lines touched, creating a complete circle were good luck. You can rub them and trace that line when you feel afraid or worried. I instinctively reached to my chest and ran my fingers across the smooth gray pebble that hung from my neck as a necklace. A former boyfriend and former climbing partner used to tell me, I don't believe in luck, when I would wish him some before heading out on a climb. To me, this exclamation exuded a self-assured trust and ability that at the time I was deaf to have. So disarming as it was to hear from him, I started to repeat the same mantra to others if they wish me some. I don't believe in luck. What I found in this denials of luck's existence was not self-trust or self-confidence. Instead, with each repetition, a narrative of isolation hardened inside of me. It is on you and you alone to deal with your fear. Do not show weakness and certainly do not show that you subscribe to something as trivial as luck. I brought the small pebble to touch my chin and bit my lower lip. Maybe but I didn't believe in luck, but was it necessary to deny its existence in such a pretentious way? What, I, what had I been trying to prove? That I could operate outside the forces of luck, that I wasn't afraid? My necklace didn't have the white line around it. The wire that connected it to the string around my neck gave me the same comfort on the wall. A comfort and confidence deeper than outwardly denying luck. To be here in this moment you are safe when I was 10 or 11 my mom's dad my grandpa told me that when he was my age he would sit by the window when his parents were out running errands and wait anxiously for their return I think he confided in me that afternoon because he noticed that I was sitting anxiously by a window waiting for my parents to return while he was watching my sister and me he explained that whenever his parents went out he spent most of his time at the window convincing himself they were dead somewhere he described the amount of wasted mental energy expended trying to control something he later realized he never could. I've always been a nervous kid, and in many ways, I'm still that nervous kid. 
I black out and speaking publicly, forget someone's name if I have to introduce them, endlessly seek reassurance from others before committing to something. Are you sure it's safe? What happens if, how do you know? And what if it isn't okay? Knowing this, I often wonder why I've committed most of my life to climbing, a sport that requires that I spend most of my time hanging in a harness hundreds of feet off the ground. At the window of my grandpa, I didn't admit to him that he was right in assuming my anxiety. I was too proud, but I did feel in that moment a strong connection to him combined with a strong frustration. After that, I convinced myself I was going to be afraid forever. It was somehow built into my DNA, and I became determined to prove that fact to be false. I could transcend my genes. Thank you. Wonderful, Rosie. Thank you so much. You were you were a little bit breaking up a tiny bit, but I think the essence of it came through beautifully. <laughs> yeah, um, you're just you know your wonderful descriptions and your memories and your writing. Um, just always just wonderful to hear it. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to just a quick shout out to one of our readers who uh, wasn't able to read with us tonight, Ermelinda Hernandez Monjares, um, aka Ceci, who was the graduate runner up of the Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. Um, and we'll shout out Ceci again a little bit later in the evening for her poetry prize. So next up, I'd like to um, invite into the square here, um, Emily Weisenborn, who was the undergraduate winner of the Fresno Fiction Prize. Emily's a recent uh, undergraduate exchange student at Fresno State who now studies English at Heidelberg University in Germany. And it's possibly around 4 a.m. where Emily is calling in from tonight. So we're very excited that you could be here with us, Emily. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um... So I'll be reading from my story, um, The Pizza Party in the Pit of the Pathetic. Um, I'll just get started. Um, the whole thing was meant to be a joke, but no one ever got his jokes. Maybe Alex just wasn't as funny sober as he thought he was. On the anniversary, to, anniversary of his sobriety, one year, he made his friend from work, David, go to a bar with him to truly showcase how awful sobriety had been. And once, there, there he made himself watch David drink a cocktail. He didn't necessarily want to alienate one of the only friends he had, one of the only friends he'd been able to make since he got sober, and David probably was just way too nice to stop being his friend, but this was too important. David felt completely weirded out, and Alex almost wrecked his, uh, his teeth by clenching his jaw too hard. Then he went home and had a panic attack that ended with him crying in the shower. It was all so much, too much. But Alex was determined. He might have lost most of his friends in his battle against addiction, but he wanted to make new ones. Essentially, he wanted to say yes when his coworkers, and not just David, asked him to get a drink after work. So he had just to get over hanging around people who were drinking. Thus, every Friday after his AA meetings, he and David went to the same bar, making it a tradition rather than a one-time thing. They usually split a pizza and David had a drink while Alex stared uncomfortably at him the entire time, pausing only to slowly consume one or two slices of pizza. The bar had been called the pit in a pathetic attempt to be cool. One of the lights was permanently flickering and it was always dirty, vaguely dingy and so empty. Alex got a horror movie vibe from it. And since the only thing Alex picked up from his one year college attempt failure, he was too drunk often to attend any of his classes never mind passing them, was his love for alliterations that he had gained in a random lit class he was forced to take for a degree he never completed. He started calling it the pit of the pathetic. Pizza party in the pit of the pathetic became a thing from then on. Wait, why am I pathetic? David asked when Alex told him about it. He was drinking his martini, not coincidentally the cheapest hard drink on the card with an environmentally friendly drinking straw looking very cute and very pathetic with brown, almost comically big eyes and his curls a mess that vaguely resembled noodles. Are you serious? Alex said, raising one eyebrow in a look that he hoped came off amused and not pained. You're like the pinnacle of patheticness. You're a musical theater major using this degree to barista and restock shelves at two jobs to pay off those vocal runs and you have that pathetic crush on your roommate. David flushed, 
Not true. Millie and I is completely friendly. We just share a living space. You also read stock shelves. And speaking of pathetic, are you going to tell me you picked the pit at random? It's like 12 blocks from your AA meeting. You have to take the subway. I have to say, take the subway. It's nowhere near convenient. He raised a pointed eyebrow at the bar. Shut up, Alex growled. It's cheap alcohol. You know what's also cheap? David countered, doing shots in my apartment. But the alliterations, Alex whined, and the pizza. The next week, David brought a friend. Sorry, he had said, really sounding it when he called Alex before AA. I said we were gonna hang out sometime this week and it's the only time you can make it. Can he come? Sure, Alex had said, closing his eyes, unsure if this was a good idea. If he had pan a panic attack, he'd rather just have it only around David. It turned out to be fine though. The guy, Nick, was another barista with a useless degree. Based on a suit and endless bags under his eyes, Alex assumed he had some sort of second job. He seemed to be completely okay with Alex staring at him after he gave him a quick and awkward heads up about it. The pizza captured his attention far more, or at least complaining about the pizza. Ugh, he said, digging into another slice. Why on earth do you guys come here? The cheese is truly the grossest thing I've ever tasted in my life. Alex is in love with the bartender, David said with his mouth full. Alex's head whipped around. No, I'm not, he said automatically. Nick, disregarding the last statement and without caring how obvious he was, turned around and regarded the bar. Alex buried his face in his hands. I don't see her, Nick said. It's the guy cleaning the glass, uh, David answered for Alex, who had his head buried in his hands. Nick turned back and raised his eyebrows. Oh, I get it. Alex, who also turned to the bar, considering the blonde hair, the muscles, the bone structure, only disrupted by the bump in the nose. He wonders if, you're staring, David said, sounding suspiciously smug. Alex whirled around. I thought we'd already established that this pizza party is for the prophetic. I'm just fulfilling my duties. Wait, Nick said. This is for the prophetic? David sighed. Don't take him too seriously. Ever since he stopped drinking, he's been cynical as fuck. You don't, you didn't know me before I stopped drinking, Alex protests. David stares in mock horror. You mean you've always been this way? No, I mean, Nick interrupts, looking slightly all uncomfortable all of a sudden. I'm just saying, I'm really pathetic. David blows a curl out of his eye. It once again looks like he attempted to make noodles with his hair. Do tell. Well, Nick said, sitting up straighter. I'm an unpaid intern trying to get my foot in the job market. I thought majoring in business would give me a leg up, but apparently it's too broad. He rolls his eyes. I have to do a master's to be able to consider for anything, but like, I can't afford a master's. So I, I just intern and work a second job in the morning. Also, he swallowed. Okay, so can this stay between us? Sure, Alex responds immediately. I mean, you know I'm an alcoholic and I want that to remain between us too. Let's, he clears his throat. Let's just agree that everything we say will remain anonymous. Pathetic's anonymous. It didn't have quite the same ring to it as Alcoholics Anonymous and Alex mourned the loss of alliterations, but it would have to do. Okay, Nick nodded. Well, my brother is marrying my ex-girlfriend in a month, and I'm not over her. Alice blinked, but because he couldn't think of anything appropriate to say, he decided not to comment. David sighed. I have a pathetic crush on my roommate. I fucking knew it, Alex said, his voice raised. Nick laughed, invisibly brightened, his tiredness fading enough that Alice could see the bubbly personality that was definitely in there somewhere. Maybe cat capitalism hadn't crushed it completely. I might come to this again. You all seem just pathetic enough that I'll fit right in. Nick came again. It became a thing, the weekly pizza party in the pit of the pathetic. Alex couldn't believe it. this was his life. They kept going to the pit too, which Alex found concerning. It was a little harder to stay inconspicuous now that they were regulars. So Alex made David watch the bar to check on the bartender a lot to see if he noticed anything. He didn't appear to, and Alex could breathe freer but not freely. What is it with you and this guy? David asked him one night, keeping his eye locked on the bar. Does he even know who you are? And that simple question brought Alex right back into the deepest pit of patheticness. He didn't know if the bartender, Christ, he didn't even know his name, would recognize him, and he really hoped he wouldn't. It all brought him back to his worst night. Rock bottom was a concept he'd learned a lot about in an AA. It was that many people have to reach before willing to seek help. It was what he hid here in the bar. He'd been fired from his job a week before he had been evicted, and that night he went to the bar to get really drunk. Then he kissed the bartender and puked his guts out, in that exact order. Goddamn fuck, he didn't even know his name.
Awesome, Emily. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love velocity. Um, Jefferson used that word to describe the dialogue and so vibrant, so much wit. Um, Pathetic's anonymous. I will remember that for a long time. I think. Um, thank you so much for being with us and for, for, for calling in so early. Um, so glad you made it. Thank you, Emily. Um, a quick uh, shout out again to Michelle Ferrer Alvarez, who was uh, an undergraduate runner up for the Larry um, like Levis Poetry Prize, who couldn't be with here with us tonight. Um, Michelle's a recent English alumna. Next, I'd like to introduce James T. Morrison, who was at the time an undergraduate, now a graduate student with us, but he was the undergraduate winner of the Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. James is an emerging writer whose personal narratives explore mental health, the justice system, skate culture, and being deemed essential during a global pandemic. He just started his first year as an MFA student at Fresno State studying creative nonfiction. James. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to everyone who read these pieces and thanks to Jefferson and Bryn for putting this on. Um, so I'm gonna be reading from uh, my piece, Five East. I was not excited to see Evan at all. It was a chance meeting, the type I was actively trying to avoid. Had we not made eye contact, I surely would have beat feet back to the admissions office, numbering lucky stars, but I was spotted. He called my name and waved me over to where he stood in the grass, a purple backpack leaning against his leg. The first thing out of his mouth, I heard you were dead. Evan had always been blunt by default and it was clear nothing had changed in the almost three years since I'd seen him. I couldn't really recall exactly when that was, near the end of our senior year, so May or June, 2001. Every high school in America has a story like this one. Artists, freaks, and weirdos find solace in one another and lay claim to a piece of property on campus. In our case, that was the raised dock behind the theater, plywood sets from past plays leaned against the stucco, spray paint stains on the concrete. Evan hung out back there with us. I had never been a, a, he had never been a kid I was particularly fond of, partially due to the very lack of social etiquette I was now enduring. Yeah, Evan continued, I heard you like OD'd and died or permanently lost your mind and were locked up in a mental ward or something. I stared him dead in the face and said nothing for a long few seconds. What's a person to say? I looked down at my own body as if to ensure for us both that I was in fact a living, breathing, sentient being not surrounded by hospital orderlies or strapped to a gurney with wires protruding from electrodes stuck to small shaved portions of my head. After this confirmation, I said the only thing I could think of. Well, I'm not. I was relieved to see Tommy fast approaching, looking out of place among the swarm of flip-flopped Santa Barbara City College students, a skateboard tucked under his arm, a Newport cigarette listing behind his cubic zirconia studded ears. He walked with the air of an East Coast junkie, which he was, just a street kid expecting death at 25, now pushing towards 30, trying to make a new life for himself. I lied and told Evan that it was good to see him, as I greeted Tommy with the usual slap and dap. Let's go, I said, vaguely waving goodbye to Evan and not looking or caring whether he waved back. Tommy didn't ask who the gawky ginger kid was. He was good like that. He knew if I wanted to talk about it, I would, and I didn't, so he didn't ask. I'd grown accustomed to this specific brand of camaraderie that exists among the dispossessed. People tend to ask fewer questions when they themselves don't want to answer any, though Tommy and I had grown close over the few months we'd known each other, we shared a 200 square foot room in a halfway house down on Bass Street, and we spent two months in a ditch, ass to elbow, as day laborers for a multi million dollar house rental up near the old mission. Once the grunt labor was exhausted, we were both let go, which is how I found myself on campus that day, not as a student, but manning the window at the registrar's office for minimum wage. The day labor job had been good for us both, an honest day's work and all that shit. But more importantly, it afforded us some new kicks and a couple of brand new setups to ride around town. We both grew up skateboarding and the rapid click clack click clack of sidewalk cracks under urethane acted as a solve, bringing us back to a time before we allowed the drugs and drink to pill for good old fashioned from, fun from us. We also developed an understanding in that ditch. We would back each other. We both knew how important that was, having spent years looking out only for ourselves, surrounded by others doing the same. We bombed the hill from the Mesa where the campus sits looking out over Ledbetter Beach and the sun-studded Pacific. Evan's words were stuck on repeat. What exactly had he heard and where had he heard it? 
some backyard or beachside over winter break, everyone home from their tidy colleges coalescing around a keg? Was it simply traveling through telephone wires from various dorm rooms and quads from around the country? He could have heard it from my ex-girlfriend, Charlie, maybe Danny or Ali. Any number of people witnessed small portions of my demise, and it was only natural that they would tell someone about it. Still, it made me deeply uncomfortable to imagine any of the possible scenarios that led to the obtuse interaction with Evan. It was the type of day in late March only a place like Santa Barbara can deliver. All around was the stuff of literal postcards, the wharf, the harbor, blue skies, the glittering ocean, but all I saw were the place that I, places I had been living and sleeping the year before. In the rentable catamarans pulled high onto dry sand out of the tide's reach, I saw myself in the middle of the night, in the middle of December, huddled under its oddly shaped hull, trying to keep warm. I saw myself wandering aimlessly from East Beach to the Mesa, miles on miles and days at a time, unable to quell a cratered mind. I viewed the landscape through psychologically marred lenses, and I was beginning to suspect the defects in my vision might be permanent. That stretch of sobriety was longer than any I'd embarked on, having been loaded since the day my psychiatrist prescribed me Xanax at 13, the day I discovered there were pills to fix feelings. And there I was, no drugs, no alcohol for almost 11 months. Eight of those months were spent housed in a court-ordered Pentecostal residential rehab facility called Teen Challenge, a program with cult-like tendencies and questionable ethics. That program also plucked me from the only place I'd ever really lived, somewhere in the sprawling grip of Santa Barbara County. Most of that time was spent living in the less glamorous, more working class enclave of Goleta, where I grew up, and a few years even further north in Lompoc. I only wound up in SB after I became homeless, as it hosts all the social services in the area. Now I was back downtown, and it seemed I couldn't go anywhere without an uncomfortable memory crawling around or running into someone who knew me before the trouble fully set in. I searched for familiar faces wherever I went, ready to take a side street or turn around altogether if needed. I was attempting to do the impossible, to outrun my own apparition. I heard you were dead. Sure, it seemed a fucked up way to start a conversation, but that's not why it bothered me. What bothered me was its accuracy. No doubt in my mind that Evan had indeed heard I was dead, likely from multiple sources. Worse, the statement was, at least partially, the truth in objective capital T terms. A game of telephone tends to muck up the original message. In some cases, the last person on a chain hears a phrase that resembles the initial utterance not at all, but sometimes the phrase becomes jumbled, perhaps dyslexic, but contains many elements of its origin. Those on Evan's chain surely didn't have all the facts straight, but they were within a pretty reasonable margin of error, plus or minus my literal death. Even that rumor contains some truth, one doctor bluntly explaining that the overdose had me mere moments from earthly departure. I was inhibited at the time, lending credence to his claim. The air was all just cut spring grass, ocean breeze, and rotting seaweeds as we passed Pershing Park, where I saw a familiar vagrant weaving towards an open picnic bench. This guy's liver was so fucked he looked eight months pregnant, but only on his right side. He once delivered a cautionary parable when I was living on the street, a heartfelt lament concerning his first drink, punctuated by long pulls from a tall can and a paper bag. That interaction really stuck with me, even though, or because, I was unable to heed his warning at the time. The City College campus was a half hour skate from our house, and we never took the same route twice, always on the hunt for new skate spots. Santa Barbara's climate is perfect for just about anything a person might grow, and jasmine mingled with rose and lilac and sun. The sidewalk, buckled by roots of large oaks, created perfect ramps to pop ollies off. I tried to enjoy myself, to employ what I'd heard in recovery meetings, to be grateful, present in the moment. But this was difficult, as we were just a block from Pueblo Street, where the Spanish arches of Cottage Hospital loomed like open mouths, out of which spilled tongues of memory threatening to lap me up, consume me. Five East, the hospital psychiatric wing, hung its curved terracotta shingles over all three of us Morrison boys at one time or another, but I was the only one to make the stays a habit. Thank you. Wow, thanks, James. So powerful. Thank you so much. Always wonderful to hear, hear your writing. Thank you. Um, I want to give one other quick shout out before our next um, reader, or maybe not actually, no, we're going straight to our next reader. 
um, who is Sharon McLean. Very excited to introduce Sharon. Sharon was an undergraduate runner up for the Fresno Creative Nonfiction Prize. Um, an undergraduate creative writing major, Sharon finds impetus to write from her unconventional childhood growing up in the beach cities of Southern California. Utilizing memoir and poetry, she alchemizes a painful past into healing and beauty. Um, Sharon. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Saito and Jefferson for um, coordinating this whole event. And I'm sharing a piece titled Teresa that I wrote about my sister. It's an excerpt from a longer piece. You, the oldest, the funniest, the wildest of our tribe of six. At four years old, you whispered to bees and black widows, giving them names, your playmates. As an adult, you tamed wild strays of many species. Mr. Kitty Man, once a vicious, gnashing, feral cat, became sweet and docile, eager to wear the baby bonnet you placed on his scraggly head. In kindergarten, you drew a portrait so advanced, your flummoxed teacher sent you to the principal's office. Decades later, you splashed vibrant primal colors onto canvas, creating untamed flower scapes, a striking palette that obliterated reality. You threw yourself into adventures that scared me, foreign countries, men, drugs. You swam out to sailboats with unknown crews, hitching rides. Compelled by inner turmoil, you always needed to be somewhere else. Me, careful and cautious maker of detailed color-coded lists, triple checking to make sure doors were locked. I was in awe of you. Late one night, you noticed a man spying through your window. You shocked him as you bolted into the darkness, curses and threats spewing out as you chased him the two blocks down to the deserted beach. You taught me about Brazilian music, art history, how to see lavender and yellow in a blue sky. We sang in rounds, shared a broken futon bed, and we had our secret language that kept us in our secret sister world in beach city coffee shops late at night or at boring suburban wedding showers. Shared a humor that no one understood, laughing into stomach cramps and oblivion. You sent me little gift books about sisterly love that I had no time for, but now they are tear stained. As the oldest girl, you caught his attention. They didn't believe it when you told mom what he did every day when grandma was at work. Who could survive that? Since no one saved you, you orchestrated your own escape to Aunt Judith's farm in Minnesota for the summer. When he died in early fall, you jumped up and down on his bed, throwing his stupid captain's hat high up into the air. Once you stood at the edge of the shore, agitated, distraught. As each swell lifted my feet off the gritty ocean floor, you made your way towards me through the thick white water, angry arms flailing and hacking through the waves. Your face distorted with emotion, but it was only when you were several feet from me that you burst into tears, words shooting out between choking gasps. After another eviction, mom, Bob, and our younger siblings were homeless. Finally scrounging up cash for a rental, there were no dogs allowed, so mom dropped them at the vet to be euthanized. You and I clung to each other as the breaker slammed into us, wailing hysterically at the senseless loss of two more beloved animals. Somber, despondent days when you slept too much or frenzied creative output. I was one of the few who could coax you out of those bleak, hopeless moods. Like that really bad spell on the hiking trail you screamed at everyone that you were heading back to the car. I pulled you into the dark emerald water. The freezing shock made you explode with rage. You became weightless in the river. So I cradled you like a baby, humming and talking low and sweet until you gave up, limp in my arms, tamed, just like that feral cat. 
I always pictured you and me finally smoothing out the rough edges of us, living together with our cats and our stories. I showed you the article about sisters living longer and better because they mother each other way beyond the death of their parents. The year after you died, I sorted through boxes of your belongings. I found a set of paper dolls you had made complete with matching outfits. There was something so familiar about them and then I realized they were us. You drew our faces, the Gulliher turned up noses, my square jaw, deep set eyes, your narrow face and rounder eyes. We believed in ghosts. You made me promise that whoever went first had to come back and haunt the other. I reluctantly agreed. I found solace in the nightly dreams of you in the months after you passed, but I kept searching for more. I was home when that first rain came, windows flung open to inhale the damp perfume of earth and sky. Silvery droplets shimmered, but struck me like a boulder in the gut. You should be here. You loved the rain. My throat tethered with a twining homesickness as I listened to the sad ghost notes of raindrops christening the earth. There's a special altar I made for you near my bedroom door. A blown glass urn encircles your ashes like a gleaming scarlet opal. Next to it is a picture of us laughing. It was a good day. You look sober and happy. Then there were the signs, that ER nurse with your name etched on her plastic name tag who checked Larry in the morning he almost died. The great white heron that landed on our courtyard fountain two days after the funeral and the exotic, fragrant, night-blooming Sirius, normally a single flower, but the night after you crossed over, it blossomed into huge twin flowers, ivory petals thick with a heady aroma that always reminds me of you. Thank you. Mm. Wow, Sharon, thank you so much. I, I love hearing that piece. I think I got to see it in its early draft and, and hear it a couple of times. It just gets richer and richer every time. And um, just struck by these, these friendships and these relationships that you all are writing about and the, the ways we're rooted to each other and connected to each other. Um, just such beautiful writing tonight. Um, thank you all. So before we move on to our final two um, readers this evening, just another quick shout out to Ermelinda Hernandez Monjadas, who um, was the graduate winner of the Ernesto Trejo Poetry Prize, who couldn't be with us tonight. Um, Ermelinda is an amazing multi-genre award-winning writer and a second year MFA student. And her award-winning poem was published on poets.org. And I think Jefferson has put that in the chat for us to, to view. Thanks, Jefferson. So next, I'd like to introduce Miley's Carney. Miley's was the graduate winner of the Fresno Fiction Prize. She's a third year MFA candidate in fiction. And she is the senior fiction editor at the Normal School Magazine. And her writing has appeared in Hobart's Baron Magazine and The Boiler, among other places. And this is her second Fresno Fiction Prize um, in a row. So congratulations, Miley's. And we're very excited to hear you read. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you. Um, thank, yeah, thank you all for being here tonight. I feel really lucky to be able to read alongside all of these talented writers that I truly really admire so much. Um, but I'm just going to get into my reading. Um, just the first few pages of my short story. It's called The Rage Room. My daughter will not stop calling me at work. From anywhere inside the rage room, I anticipate the ring, the tiny hairs on my forearms standing up while I'm sorting intake, when I'm scrubbing the floors. Since I left my husband almost a year ago, she has turned greedy, needing too much attention and comfort for a girl of 14. I feel it in my stomach, the wet oatmeal weight of Asana's nervousness, and I want to detach myself from her in the lull of the cleaning. Every day inside the cavern of my chest, a rubber band pulls tighter, 
waiting for the giddy electric right moment to let go. Behind the heavy metallic door, a man's dull scream escapes, accompanied by the faint sound of shattering, crystal skittering across the floor. I stand by with my cart, worry the chemical dry skin around my fingernails, wait for the fog form that announces when his time is up and when I can go inside and begin cleaning up the mess. I love the rage room, the gulf between the mess I make and the fixing I do, how the smashing laces our separate lives together like bread. Company policy says that women aren't allowed to rage inside the rage room, but we're allowed to clean it. So of course I have settled with that. The lobby telephone startles me with the same indulgence of my morning alarm. And I listen to Nika's soft murmuring to see if it's Roxana or a client checking up on their appointment. I have told my daughter a hundred times, do not call me at work unless you want to go hungry. Do not call me at work if you love me. But she doesn't listen. She rings any time she likes. I look at the clock above the door, blinking down the seconds until the end of this man's session. Down the hall, Nika calls to me, Maggie, it's for you. Our secretary is a daft little thing, all elbows and skirts, and how can I help you in watery-eyed smiles? During the day, I avoid her, but she catches me between my work to ask me the beg that I let her see inside. The rage room only attracts a particular type of woman, a woman who yearns for more space than she's allowed. It's not nice of me, but I don't tell her. I feel my lips up tight. I pretend I could never sneak her in. I like how she quivers with want. Oh, I have the power to decide how long it eats her up. I leave my cleaning cart by the door and go to the front desk, press the receiver into my ear. What, I say, firm but quiet, because I know Nika is listening. Sometimes I think she's embarrassed by my inability to quiet my daughter, the only thing in this world I should be able to control. Mama, Oksana's voice crinkles through the phone. She is in that awful place I remember, the chasm between child and adult and how awful it is to cross it with no safety nets underneath. My stomach hurts. I shift on my warm ankles as my daughter relents the trials of her morning. I tell her not to call me at work, but I can't help but feel a thin release settle on my shoulders when I hear her gravelly voice, that she is alive, unhurt, and needy, that she calls me and not my ex-husband. Her call is long and winding, beginning with her stomach and concluding with some vague mentions of girls and their meanness, the sharpness of their tongue. I twist the sticky cord on the phone until her voice grows distant and crackly until I'm alone with Nika's nervous breathing and the sound of the man smashing his way through the room. When I let go, her voice bounces back sharp like the meal of a kitten. Oksana, you act like a child. I will be home in the evening. You must manage until then, I say. Nika takes the phone back from me and places it too gently behind the desk. I thank her just as the foghorn sounds and she nods and looks towards the door. In the quiet, I know what she wants, but it's too meek to say. I must get back to my work. The man lets out one final wail. I fire on the shore morning the thing she loved and then drown. I walk quickly back to the closet, ready my cart, wait for the sound of the door releasing before I can enter the rage room and begin cleaning up the mess. The door clicks. I pull on my glove. I open the door and roll my cart inside. I breathe in the faint twirling of dust and spittle, the sweet earthy smell of sweat lingering in the air. I step over thin shards of glass. I pick up my room and sweep. I lose time in the cleaning. I pick up pieces of vases, planks of splintered wood, green and red cracked ceramic plates. I stuff broken canvas paintings and shreds of paper into a large stretchy trash bag. I thought clean the floors, the walls, the blinking green digital clock that counts down the minutes before each 45 minute session is up. Inside the rage room, behind the thick steel door, I can't hear the ring of the phone. I am utterly alone and alive. I set up the new items, the rows of vases, ceramics, and wooden plates, up planks, stacks of papers, cushions, and fresh pencils to sound. I prop up the dummy woman, I named her Sylvie, and brush her sickly yellow hair behind her flat plastic ears. I pity the freshy realness of her arms, how cold they are, how unlike Oksana, whose arms are so girlish and easy to pinch with my fingers when she's naughty, despite how fast she wiggles from my reach. With 20 seconds to spare, I roll my cart out and back into the closet. I catch only a glimpse of the next man checking in at the counter, jitteriness in his shoulder, shaking his carefully gelled hair. In his nervousness, he reminds me a little of my husband, my ex-husband, I suppose I should, I should say. 
It has been nearly 11 months since I left him, but sometimes I still slip into old habits. Sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night, I can feel the weight of his hand on my thigh, his snoring just above my right ear. Oksana has not forgiven me for leaving her father, though I tell her it was for the good of us both, our need for quiet and less violence, less drunken nights and strange women hiding underneath my bed. In his absence, her memory of him grows fonder, softer, the dry sting of scolding is replaced by the lavender sweetness of flowers given in springtime, weekends spent dancing around the kitchen, the music scratching through the radio. In his place, I grow monstrous, controlling and ever tired. I am the woman she will resist and become anyway. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> and that was just an excerpt, I think, right? Yeah. Gosh, I want you to send me the whole piece. I want to read the whole piece. <laughs> that was really stunning, Miley's. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Um, so I just, uh, one more shout out tonight to Delaney R. Olmo, who couldn't be with us this evening, but was the graduate winner of the Mia Baratza Martinez Prize for Social Justice Writing, um, and a runner up for their Ernest, or for, for the Ernesto Trejo Poetry Prize. Um, Delaney's a recent MFA alumna. So our final uh, poet and writer this evening is Hua Li. Hua is the undergraduate winner of multiple prizes um, this year, the Sol Vang Poetry Prize, the Mia Baratza Martinez Prize for Social Justice Writing, and the Larry Levis Poetry Prize. As an undergraduate creative writing major, Hua Li is a Hmong American writer born and raised in California. She likes 3 a.m. sodas for when inspiration hits, and she, be she believes that there's a little bit of magic in everything. Um, this is the first time we can remember the student, that a student has won three of our creative writing prize contests in the same year. Um, Hua's poem, the Levis Prize poem, was published on poetstock.org, and we, we will put the link in the chat. So please join me in welcoming Hua Li. Right. Um, thank you so much, Bryn, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Jefferson, for the work that you do. And thank you, everyone else, for being here tonight and listening to our works. This first poem that I'm reading is titled, Scavenge Your Hunt to Where We See Our Ghosts and Run Toward Them. Don't forgive me, Dad. If you want to know why I kissed that girl under your motion sensor porch light, we'll start with the night a deer hopped in front of our truck. I looked back even when you told us eyes forward. I wanted to know how destruction might look like. How I might peel open when you someday took a corkscrew to my body, body turning to pulsing. You skinning my flesh into clothes pinned blanket, making me dare corpse. Veins can stretch an approximate 100,000 miles. And I imagine you laying mine out on roadside deciphering each secret encoded into blood vessel. When all else fails, take to the roadmap and pin my veins as navigation route to where I hid my fingernails under Jeffrey Pine roots in Kalinga as tribute to your severed finger. Write our names beside each other. Circle our last three letters. O, to make, creator, to do. You and I determiners of our own fate. You, survivor of the secret war, orphan child, me, daughter of war refugee, outcasted queer. The difference between prey and pursuer is the distance between them. And what makes a survivor is what was left behind. Motherland, rice patties, cicada temple music. Y'all know. So the pursuer is behind us. So the pursuer becomes a part of us. You and I contained by our traumas that deer on the road, both of us. Travel by car or foot three miles down the same road, the area where I saw the man in the field, silver and shivering like a glitch in reality, more hesitant silhouette than a human. He's us, our ghost, our residue. Have you found him yet? Have you found him? Or are you still holding the gun to your temple like the liquor green knight I found you? 
your feet plastered on carpet doing nothing to ground you, your finger balancing gravity against trigger. Can you see my hesitant silhouette? This means I am beside you. This means our heartbeats will sink soon. This means you are alive. This means you are staying. Veins can stretch an approximate 100,000 miles, enough for us to cocoon ourselves into another tomorrow. Put the gun down, dad. Lock it away. You once told me holes were evidence something has suffered someone's rage. You couldn't be a thief because you were afraid your children would slip through like egg yolk when you carried us on backside. Because you were careful to know one hole in the fabric could manifest a weak spot for a larger tear, could cause it to be discarded. And this next poem is titled Dark Landing Signals. In researching hate crimes against the LGBT plus community, I scoured through countless news articles and perceived a noticeable pattern. Many LGBT plus victims had been stabbed or in the event of their murder was stabbed among various transgressions. How hatred could make a knife, could make a wound. We were stabbed because we were beautiful. Our spirits confined to the hollow of trees, corralling our glitter tears into tangible, tangible evidence if the moon blazes, then our bones are meant for thunder. We're causes of emergency blares, pointing our fingers and saying, let the lightning strike there. Pantomime me something greater than the grief of bleeding a millennia's worth of unwarranted violence. Give me somewhere safe to land, a floral carbon line to anchor myself in glitch blips and monster creeks. Three years spent on discovering how my ghost marked me for the grave and sending myself back six feet deep, wide-armed and embracing. I'm still me, but my mirror shelters a nomadic corpse, loose-leaf music sheets ripe for the taking in every way similar to how my tongue ripped out a chromatic lie. I don't find her beautiful. I could easily forget her name as I could the phone number a boy wrote on my hand yesterday. Mother tiptoeing from the mud storm of her garden, left leg wreathed in childhood oleanders, crooning Oshela, the power of our ancestors' spirits shouting her back. Give me power too, to decide who I want to be. She gifted my people split horns and finger bows to protect us from hungry teeth spirits. But where are the tools to love ourselves, to love each other? She smearing bone ash on my cheek, Palm bright as swallowed fluorescence, tying tiger bone to my chest and humming, this bone for added courage. But in return, how brave will you be for her? Get this, for my lover, I would flip my heart inside out if it meant becoming hers. I would open the lion's maw myself and join her. Listen, we are still alive and that means no one can tell us how the blood flows in our bodies. We enact the metamorphosis we have been awaiting of tunneling a six feet hole for robo bullets pouring a splash of blessed sugar water and witnessing the advent of a spawn of swans. Self-love, darling. Here is our landing among our predecessors who discovered their forms and sword swallow silhouettes, their hundred arms carrying us to a new beginning. Ketoku de Kongashia. And this next and final poem is titled In Which Orpheus is a Confused Hmong Daughter. It's just a short excerpt because the original poem was a longer epic poem that I tried <laughs> to write out. So, a marketplace for souls trading in paper money for an item of their loved one. Something small, something unnoticed. Bells clinking, children and outers crying, the man with weak colored skin, cataract eyes with crow's feet, black trousers torn raw at the pant break, trades in his last crumpled jaw spill for one of his daughter's pins, still warm with life from her hand. Jostled by the milling crown, his branch gnarled fingers quiver. Two strings of fate, one attached to his wrist, the other to the pin both ordained to part ways. It falls on the ground, he falls on the ground. Neither find their way back to each other. A child worms through the huddle, half his pink ripened, pink in delight, the other half a deformed tragedy from an indiscriminate fire. Blade in his left fist, slices the patched pocket of an unsuspecting woman mulling over honey melons. 
A single coin fills the basin of his hand. Disappointed, he kicks up dust, slouches away, hands in his pockets, laden with cut holes, not by his own design. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you, Wa. It's wonderful to see your work again. And thank you for screen sharing it with us. That was um, that was such a way to kind of capture and track the, the richness of the language and the poetry. Um, but I that line, listen, we are still alive, that's really staying with me. Um, it's really beautiful. Um, extraordinary, yes, as someone said in, in the chat. Um, well, that sort of wraps up our, our evening this tonight, um, our presentation. Um, I just like to include con conclude with a couple of um, thanks and reminders. Um, all of these prizes are generously supported by members of our community. And so we'd like to give shout outs to the friends and family of Ernesto Trejo and Larry Levis with a special thanks to Chuck Hanslicek who established the Trejo and Levis Prize endowments with the Academy of American Poets. And many thanks to the friends and family of Mia Baratza Martinez and to David and Jackie Everwine, and also, also to Sol Vang. So big round of virtual applause for all of these supporters for championing the work of our students. And